All right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me. We're in a little bit of a different setting, but that's because today is going to be a special lesson. Uh, so just a recap, just in case any of you are new. I'm Deidre. I am the workshop designer as well as the webinar instructor for today. And this is going to be the Your Waste to Edible Greens webinar series by Live in Farms. And today we're going to be talking about output, mealworms for human food. Okay, so in terms of what we're going to be doing today, I will be running through the presentation really quickly for the lesson that we have planned, which will be looking at alternative protein burgers, what's in them, what makes them special, and the original activity is going to have the students making and designing their own mealworm burgers. But for today, just because of the timing of everything, I actually wanted to show you guys how to prepare your own mealworms from the hive. And we'll just get that ready and we'll be able to uh, get to taste some mealworms. And maybe you can try this at home and you let us know how they taste like. All right, let's get started. Okay, so just as a recap for everyone as to why we're even considering talking about eating mealworms, it's, if we look at the same amount of beef protein compared to the same amount of mealworm protein, generally by kilogram, we see that the use of resources for the mealworms is generally much less than that of beef, right? In this graph, you can see land usage, food, water, global warming, uh, global warming potential are all much lower for mealworms. Land, when we think of land, we have to think about the habitat that we raise them in, these mealworms. Like you can see, I actually have the hive explorer right here and it's just sitting on, on my desk. And yeah, they don't really take up a lot of space compared to the same amount like by weight of a cow that needs an entire pasture, right? And then when we look at food, we have to also consider the land usage and the water usage of the food that feeds the animals. And so beef is going to have a lot more because you need a lot more grass and a lot more hay and things to feed that single animal versus mealworms that literally are eating our food waste. All right. Okay, and in terms of the health benefits as to me eating mealworms, there are a lot of different benefits with it. These include things like uh, the protein content, uh, amino acid profile. We, if we think about amino acids, those are like the building blocks of protein. So it's really important to have those in your body and the body can't create all of the essential amino acids that we need, which is why we need to eat certain things with high protein content. Mealworms have that similar to the profile of that of tofu, so that's really great. They also have vitamin B12, which is similar to what is found in eggs. We've got more fiber here than broccoli. It's great brain food. It's great for your teeth. It's great for, uh, it's great for your liver. And we've got just a lot of really great reasons to at least incorporate a little bit of mealworms in your diet. Okay, and just final part of this review is that for webinar number six, lesson number six, we did give the students this sustainable restaurant prompt where they had to come up with this idea for a sustainable restaurant and at least start brainstorming ideas. That's what they were doing. This lesson, we're going to be showing them how they can incorporate mealworms into their menu if that's something that they wanna do. And also it's just a fun activity and it is something that you can do at home as well. All right. Okay, so let's get started. When we're talking about burgers, we're, it, that's a pretty standard kind of food, especially standard American and international fare, right? We've got a burger, and a burger, even though it can be very fancy or it can be very basic, it all has similar components to them. And those three parts would be the bun, of course, which is going to be bread, or in Asia, sometimes people put rice crackers instead, or like you can swap out a lot of things. You can go bunless. And then there's toppings. It'll be the lettuce, the cheese, the tomatoes, things like that. And the most important part would be the patty. And this is where a lot of the substitution will take place when we're talking about replacing meat. Okay, and by now you've probably heard of plant-based uh, alternative meats, alternative protein. And what I have on the screen are th examples of three major brands 
that are found here in Hong Kong. We've got Impossible Meat, Beyond Meat, and Omniport. Okay, and although they're all marketed as being very different, you can see what I've done is broken down into a primary protein, texture, oil, binding agent, and flavor. These are just different components and how each of the companies tackle each of those, uh, those essential parts of an alternative meat burger. So let's break it down a little further. The first part of the patty yep, is going to be the protein base. And what we have here is actually just an extension or just a visualization of the worksheet we give to the students. So options here are going to change depending on what is available in your region. And so this is just, sorry, go back. This is just the example that we have. So for, in terms of the protein base, we give all groups of students half a cup of mealworms, which they have to incorporate into their burger. They're welcome to use more if they want. Uh, tempeh, which in Indonesia is a very uh, common type. It's like a fermented soybean, also very high in protein. We've got chickpeas, shiitake mushrooms. Okay, and then when you're making the burger, you also need to consider texture. If it's important to you, like it is for Impossible and Beyond Meat and Omni Pork, actually, they all are trying to not just provide plant-based meats, but they're trying to mimic those meats that they're trying to give an alternative to. Okay, and in doing that, you can put things like beets, you can put things like coconut oil and in a solid form, and that will help give more of a texture to what you're trying to create. Okay, and next we have oil. Oil is important because naturally we, we don't, we, we add a little bit of oil when we're cooking, but in general, animal fats have a lot of this oil already in it. And it'll help by adding the oil, you're making sure that you're not burning the patty while it cooks, right? You can add different types of oil, um, canola, sunflower, blah, blah, blah. They're all plant-based. You can add those and give it a try. And a really important part that we don't always think about is going to be the binding agent. This is important in, in an alternative meat patty because we don't have uh, things that will keep the patty sticking together in the way that not regular meat does. So we need to add things like potato starch, which is very common, or rice. But the rice does have to be quite glutinous, so it could be like sushi rice, for example. And of course, we've got the seasoning, which is important. Again, these can all change. You can add salt, you can add black pepper, you can add whatever you want. Whatever the taste that you want, you can add that. Okay, and so that's actually pretty much it. We try to keep this PowerPoint quite short because students will be making a lot. What we have also doing, uh, ha we also have the students doing is that once they've decided on all the ingredients for their burger, before they start cooking, they actually calculate the impact of each of their ingredients and how much of a impact in terms of kilograms of carbon emissions they have just by making that burger compared to a regular burger. A regular burger will have about three point, regular beef burger will have about 3.4 kilograms of carbon dioxide emitted. And an example that I chose, and actually if the students are following the worksheet, which will all be plant-based anyway, they'll have a number between like 0 0.5 to one kilogram per carbon dioxide emitted per burger. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you guys now is going to be the cooking part, right? I think that's why a lot of you guys came. So this will, this will cover a few major parts. And while I'm doing it, please send in questions. We have someone actually moderating so they can make sure that I get around to the questions. All right, so the first thing is that I have these two boxes of mealworms. What I did is a few days ago, I took a few mealworms from the hive. I literally just put them right into here and then you have to let them sit for two days. You're doing this because you don't wanna add any food to them, right? We want them to actually not be defecating and not be creating any waste during this time and we want them to clean their system. After the two days, we are going to put them in the freezer, which I've already done as well. And this is a, human, a humane way to put them to sleep and to um, essentially like kill them, right? And prepare them for eating consumption. After two days, you take them out 
And that's what we have here. You can thaw them out for a few minutes, which is what I've done. And yeah, let's get started and start getting the mealworms prepared for eating. Okay. So what I have first is I just have a sieve and I have a bowl. Okay, I'm gonna, all right, so it's a little loud, but I'm going to open the mealworms. You can see them here. And the very first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna wash them. Hey, right, you've got the mealworms here. Okay. Right? Okay, now I'm just gonna wash them. Oops. And take your time with this. These are living animals and no matter what you're eating, you do want to wash before you eat them. You guys can hear me. Right, you just, it's less of a wash actually and more of a rinse. Okay. And then because we live in Hong Kong and the tap water is not, you generally don't want to eat it right after that. I'm just going to put a little of filtered water as well. All right. Okay. Okay, right? So you can see we've got them all rinsed. Okay. All right, now what I've done is I've actually already prepared some warm water here in a pot. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put all the mealworms in here and I'm gonna set it to boil for five minutes. All right. Okay. Oops. All right. Okay, so we're gonna leave it for a few minutes and I'll just talk to you guys for, for a bit. Uh, probably because I think like a common thing that we often get is about the ethical questions of eating mealworms. And I will say that if you eat meat, it is, it is quite important for a lot of us to really have an understanding of where our food comes from and what is entailed with actually um, killing the animal and consuming it, right? Very often, especially if we live in the city, we don't have a lot of that uh, that relationship with where our food comes from. And in fact, I've been I've lived in a lot of different places, and in some places, it's very common for people to be very uh, distant from their food. Like if you see in in Asia, for example, it's very common to eat fish and have the head still on, and to know that while you're eating it, that that is what you're eating. Um, it, that isn't true for everyone. I've had friends who are very freaked out if food is looking at them, right? And with the mealworms, personally, I like to just say a little thank you. You don't have to do that. It's whatever you're more comfortable with. And just to acknowledge that not only are we growing the, this food, but we're also taking responsibility for their life and for their death. Okay. And do we have any questions, by the way? Let's see. Does the texture change as you rinse them? Okay. Yeah, actually the texture, the texture of the mealworms, you can feel them, they start to change not because of the washings per se, it's actually because we froze them for, for a few days. And so when you leave them at the thaw, they will get quite soggy. That's normal. And then when you rinse them, it's gonna get even soggier. But the thing is the, because the mealworms have this uh, exoskeleton made of chitin, they're still going to remain their firmness and their crunchiness. And we're going to put them in, that's why we're going to put them in the oven. It's going to um, cook them for us and they're going to be super crunchy when they come out. So, you know, fingers crossed. Let's, <laughs> let's make sure that we get this. Okay. That's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, do we have another question from anyone?
Um, okay. Have you ever tried boiling them to make stock? Personally, I have never. Not. Oh, do you mean like soup stock, right? No, I ha I personally have never tried that. Yeah, soup stock. I've never tried that. Um, I'm not. So I can't tell you how good that is. Definitely, if you have some mealworms on hand to give it a try, I, th I predict it'll taste like whatever spices you put in. Oh, bless you. <laughs> yeah, I, what I do, like, I, you know, I think what would be interesting to try is because what I do is in my house, we will have a lot of, like, vegetable scraps, and you can keep those vegetable scraps and save them for soup, even the eggshells, even like shells from shrimp, for example, you can save all of those and you can freeze it. And then once that is done, you can um, take it out and you're ready, you have enough food scraps, and then you boil that for a few hours. And it would be really interesting to put some mealworms in there too, actually. And that's a great way to reuse your old food scraps and then also like put a little extra protein in there. I'm going to move these around a little bit. Let's give it a little stir. Um, going to, yeah, you can see they're just kind of, some of them will float, some of them will sink. That's normal. Ah, here we go. All right. It's okay. Generally, we do want the water to boil. It is very hot, though. I actually put in hot water, boiling water before this. Okay. Okay, hi, Shwan. Oh, thank you for coming back. Okay, do they always have to be boiled first? That's a good question. From my understanding, it's always a good idea to boil them first. What we're doing during this boiling process is after we wash them, we want to just get rid of everything else that might be an issue in terms of health reasons. Uh, and like when you're cooking meat, for example, you want to make sure it's cooked all the way. In most cases, I guess if you eat sushi, that's probably not, not what you're looking for. Okay, I wonder what mealworm stock tastes like. We're getting a lot of questions. This actually makes me really happy. <laughs> Yeah, and unfortunately, I can't answer all of them, but, you know, the fact that you guys are engaging is already such a treat. <laughs> all right, it looks like it's boiling. All right. Okay, let's just turn this off for now. Okay, I'm going to rinse, because we did use this already. I'm just going to rinse it again really quickly while that cools. Oh, and something I think which is quite important to mention is that if you have a seafood allergy, just please be very cautious when eating these guys. They're not direct relatives, but they are quite closely related. Uh, insects are arthropods, which are in taxonomically quite similar. So we just need to be mindful of that. Somebody asked, if we control what they eat, then do we still need to boil them? I would still boil them. Uh, I think it's important to remember that these mealworms, when we have them in the hive or just anywhere in particular, if you even have like a home version of this, mealworms are uh, like to live in quite densely populated colonies. And so they're gonna be mixing with each other, they're going to be mixing with the dead skin, and there's going to be a lot of um, there's a lot of things going down on down there on like a micro uh, bacterial level that we just want to make sure that we clean everything out, right? Um, it's good practice to do that. Just make sure that you are maintaining good hygiene. You know, especially during these times, right? It's not just uh, you and the mealworms; it's also you know like us personally and in our gut. Okay, I'm going to use this. All right. Okay. So now I'm just going to pour these guys 
in. All right, we got some mealworms, al dente. Nice, I've got a few more in there. Okay, I'm gonna put this back. Yeah, and we're just gonna run, rinse them. Actually, this is cool already. Just gonna rinse them in a little more water. Right. There you go. Shake them around, get some water out. Yeah, and they're looking good. Take a look at that. All right. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is I'm going to take this tray, I'm gonna put it here, and I'm gonna take some aluminum foil as well. So just to answer your question, mm -hmm. we're not just sterilizing the bacteria. So the basic idea is just that since these uh, mealworms are living close to one another, their chances of bacteria infection, just general dirt and dead skin that get attached to them. And that's why, just like with any other vegetable, fruit, or meat, you always wash it before you cook it and eat it. So it's, it's simply like that. And Yes, you could surely achieve it by sauteing and frying. It's just that before you do that, you just like to wash it to just make sure it's clean and sanitary to eat. Absolutely. Thank you, Savina. Savina actually has a background in nutrition and nutritional sciences, and she is quite knowledgeable in these things. She's a great help. Okay. So now that I have these mealworms, I'll also say that I have preheated the oven at a low temperature. I did it at 150 degrees Celsius. I will lower it a little bit more. Uh, you don't really need to have them on that high. And I'm just gonna put them on here. And I'm going to spread them out on the sheet. All right. Spread them out. Okay. Always important, you gotta put some oil on there. We're using olive oil today, but you can definitely experiment with some coconut oil and some others. Olive oil, it depends on the taste that you want really too. I'm gonna drizzle it a little. You can actually mix it in a bowl and move them around. I think that's more than enough. And I'll just gonna Make sure that they're all quite oiled up, right? And then we're gonna spread them around. Okay, in terms of seasoning, that will really depend on the taste that you're going for. It really, I always like to put black pepper, um, salt, and I personally like chili, so I'm gonna put a little bit of that as well, and some Cajun. All right, so let's see, salt. Oops, that was a lot. <laughs> and then uh, pepper. Let's see, this is cayenne. I'm gonna put a little bit of that. And some Cajun. Okay. And then just a final mix again. We just wanna get everything kind of seasoned evenly. Again, you could definitely do this in a bowl, but I think it's just a little easier this way. Okay, make sure you spread them out. Keep in mind, mealworms are very small and have a lot less water than a lot of the vegetables you're gonna be cooking. So we don't need to put them on a high heat and we also don't need to cook them for very long. We're actually only gonna be cooking them for about 10 minutes until they're this golden brown color. All right. I'm gonna 
close that up and we're gonna leave it for let's say 10 minutes. I'm gonna put a timer now. Okay, so let's do some questions now while we're waiting. Yeah, we're going to leave for about 10 minutes. And okay, I, we often get the question, what do mealworms taste like? So hopefully for those of you who have already bought the hive, you are going to find this out for yourself. Um, mealworms are generally quite nutty. Again, it'll depend on the seasoning that you want, but if you're just getting plain mealworms, yeah, nutty is nutty is kind of the the general consensus. Okay. And also with the mealworms, just keep in mind when you first get your new mealworms, you're going to want to let them in the hive, leave them in the hive or whatever your new environment is for about two weeks, because you want you want to make sure that if anything came in with the mealworms because in some places especially in asia there is a chance of cross-contamination and then like different bugs that are not mealworms might get in there so you just want to give them about two weeks to kind of either leave the hive they tend to disappear most often because there's so many mealworms and only a few of those other insects they get outcompeted and that's why they they tend to go away let's see have you ever tried making something sweet with them Okay, this is great because we actually just made, sorry, we just made a video uh, in the Austria team. The Austria team just did this where they made chocolate, uh, chocolate covered popcorn with some mealworms on top. And I believe that video should be coming out soon, but you can literally put mealworms in anything that you want. Again, it will really depend on what kind of food you're making. And I know that it's often quite, like the idea of eating mealworms is not always the most uh, appetizing for some people, especially if they're very new to entomophagy. So what you can do, and I'll show you really soon, is that you can actually just put them straight into the blender and you can make a powder that you can just kind of season on top of anything. And that is a very simple. It literally only takes a few seconds once you take them out of the oven. And then you have like a powder that can go on anything and it's just a little boost of, you know, protein and B12 and all those other great vitamins. Yeah, it is, it's quite yummy. And it's, I've eaten a lot of other types of insects. Um, I've tried silkworm pupae soup I had with a friend of mine in Korea is one of his childhood dishes. It really does, it's a little like chicken in that it really depends on, on what you're putting into it and the seasons. Okay, could you even put it through chocolate, like amaranth or something similar? Through chocolate. Yeah, I would, I would suspect that you could. The thing is, I mean, maybe this will, this will freak people out, but generally when you eat things like chocolate and most of our foods, in order to, to actually reach the the quota of it being hygienic and sanitary, they have to put a quota for like the amount of insects that, and insect parts that are allowed in your food. Because frankly, they get in everywhere. And so there's no way that you can have zero insects in your food. And chocolate is one of those things where, yeah, they kind of wind up in there. You don't really notice it. And honestly, you get a little more protein. It's a completely natural process, but that does freak people out sometimes when they think about it. Okay, I've had ant eggs. Um, different kinds of flavors, really yummy. Yeah, you know, my mom actually, she has had, so she when she was growing up, she was curious and she ate some ants and the ants that she had were quite spicy, actually. I have personally haven't tried ants like that, so I wouldn't know, but, you know, I'm going to take her word for it and I'll definitely take your word for it too. Okay, you said to wait two weeks after the first mealworm comes to eat, in to eat them. I was told to wait three generations. What would you recommend? Okay, yeah, so two weeks is generally something we say because we do want to have like multiple, we want the mealworms to be able to live in the hive and start breeding and having babies. And three generations, 
it's really hard to tell once it's in the hive, you know, which individuals are the first generation, which are the second generation. And again, it's going to depend on where your source of mealworms are coming from. So whenever you do get them, first keep in mind that you understand where, like what country they're coming from. Try to do more research or you can ask uh, representatives from, from live-in farms as to where they source those mealworms. And then you, you can get an estimate between two weeks and a month. Again, the, the timing is less about the mealworm generation, which is actually how you should be doing it. But it's more about the ease of predicting like when it's actually a good time to eat them. So I guess my point is to just ask a representative once you've ordered your hive and you've put them in the hive. You know, another another way you could do it is just like leave them in there for two months and then you're very likely good. <laughs> so yeah, great. Okay. Let's see. Let's check how are they doing. They're sizzling. Okay, let's see if we can get the camera in there. They're looking quite good. This one looks vertical. Yeah. I can't really. Oops. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, it's standing. I might actually stir them for a bit. So. Again, like I said, mealworms are very small. It doesn't take a lot to cook them. We're also going to want to mm, gonna stir them a little. Actually smells great, guys. Yeah. I wish there was like a smell -o meter or whatever. <laughs> Actually, one of the dogs ate the mealworms too, like not cooked. So, you know, pets can do it. We don't always talk about that, but cats and dogs have such high protein content in their diet normally. And if we start to consider the uh, global warming implications of those, the global climate change, sorry, uh, we have to also consider what our dogs and cats are eating, and we don't always do that. Yeah, and the thing is, you don't have to only feed your dogs and cats just mealworms or just any other insect. Um, but, you know, as with anything, it's good. You can try to like substitute a little bit. Maybe it means that you're not relying so much on the dog food. In my house, we do have one dog and uh, we feed half dog food, half of, um, half of leftover rice, half of leftover vegetables. And so the dog is getting like a balance of what we're eating. And dogs have evolved to actually kind of be like our dumpsters. That's the, the dog and human relationship is very interesting. and. It's so we tend to baby them on what they eat, or like the industry has taught us to baby them on what they're eating, but they're actually okay as long as you stay away from particular fruits and vegetables, which you can always Google. Okay, can we store the harvested mealworms like in the freezer? Also, cooked mealworms, can we store them? Yeah, so if you want to store them, you can store dried mealworms, but it would be it will depend on where you live. So once you've put them in the oven, They'll and you leave them to dry out. You can put that in, in a jar and you can store that for at least a month. It'll depend on like the humidity of the climate too. For Hong Kong, for example, it's not going to last a month. Alternatively, you could take them out of the oven, let them cool, put them in a jar, and then put them in the fridge and they should last longer. Oh, and we have like another comment from um, KE and is that our chickens love them. And yeah, chickens, chickens love them. Again, you can feed them to your dogs and your cats. Our, the dog here just ate one. And even hamsters like them, fish like them. They're really great protein sources, not just for humans. So there's a lot of things that you can try with these guys. And honestly, if you take photos and you tag Live in Farms in them or you message uh, contact at liveinfarms.com, yeah, share the stories with us because we also want to share that this is a really great opportunity and a fun opportunity for people to really learn about more uh, personal sustainable things that they can do other than just like the very uh, the very big actions right again sustainability can be quite daunting and it covers some very big topics but we can start to break things down at a smaller level and start to work on things personally and in our own homes and in our own kitchens Okay, we have another question. 
Okay, is boiling them, oops, okay, is boiling them compulsory? And what is the purpose? Okay, we have mentioned this, but I will say it again, that it's mostly just to, it's to sanitize them, it's to clean the, the dead skin and the other, the other things from these mealworms because they are living in high densities inside the hive and in other places. These are just, that's the natural ecology of these animals, that's how they live. And you wanna just, yeah, you just wanna really clean them thoroughly and rinsing them is not going to be enough. There is uh, things like bacteria that are very common with these guys and they live very harmoniously with them, but it's just a good thing. Uh, it's like a good measure for us to clean as well. Okay, and I tried deep frying them straight from the freezer. Would this be okay or should I boil them first? Um, I mean, if you do it and this is not something you're doing every day, it's likely that nothing's going to happen if you deep fry them. I hope they were, I hope they tasted good. Also, one more interesting point was that why you wash your mealworms before cooking them is not only to prevent um, the bacteria that is, might already be on the mealworms from um, affecting you, but it's also that washing and cleaning your produce before you cook it prevents the food itself from catching viruses or uh, foodborne illnesses. So it's also post, not just. Mm, good point. Thank you, Savina. And final question says, if boiling is a compulsory step, can I freeze boiled mealworms for storage? So the purpose of the freezing the mealworms is really because we want to kill them in a way that is humane, and it's essentially like putting them to sleep, uh, but like, you know, forever sleep. And, <laughs> and you can definitely, if you want to store them, I would recommend taking them from the hive, uh, freezing them, and then when you take them out, you boil them and then put them back in the freezer. I wouldn't, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't personally take them from the hive, wash them, and then boil them because they're still alive and that isn't personally what I would do. And I, I, we, as a company, we wouldn't be recommending that. Okay, you're welcome, Ivan. They're crispy. They're crispy? Nice. Okay. All right, so that's going well. A few more minutes, so let's keep taking questions or I can tell you guys a little bit more. Let's see. Oh yeah, if you guys are, um, joining us because we do actually have more people joining us than normal i can see there's some familiar names here and thank you so much for joining us again but in case you are new please let us know how you're how you found about out about us oh we also have a code for all of you guys since you are joining us today let's see so you can get your discount code for 20 percent, and this is a code that's exclusive for uh this webinar that we're having. So only you guys who are joining for the webinar and have joined for a few weeks, you can get this 20% discount. On the website, it's going to be 10%. So you better get it while it's <laughs> while you're here. Okay, let's see more questions. Da -da. Yeah, and honestly, like, if you have more stories about different insects that you're trying out, would love to hear them. It's, insects are very diverse. And and the way that people eat them, there's been such long histories throughout time of people eating them. I cover it very, very briefly in the blog that's on the Hive Explorer website, which you guys, I would recommend checking out. I do really love writing those blogs. Um, and I do touch upon how insects have been important to the development of humans. Again, this is a very brief look at it, but if it is new information to you, I think it's a great place to start. Okay, have you ever had a mealworm break out at home? Do you mean uh, when they're like like an infestation, like outside of the hive, coming out of the hive? Okay, I really enjoy talking about this because because our oops, engineer, product engineer at Living Farms, has worked really hard to make a product that we're really proud of, and as someone who has worked with insects and 
even in college, I would be going to class and having a lecture and then realize that there was just like a bug that just popped onto my paper. <laughs> it's because insects have, are notorious at getting out. But with the hive, you'll find when you get it, it's not the easiest to open. And that's on purpose because, yes, it might not be the most convenient for you per se, but it's also really inconvenient for them to get out. And it serves two purposes. It keeps the mealworms in and it keeps the it keeps the smell in. And so I'll say this, that I've personally never had mealworms get out. And actually, we have them in the office and they've never gotten out. Sometimes you'll get one little straggler, but never an infestation. And that's a really... That's a really great thing with insects. And to answer your latest question, do we have a table of information with calorific values? Well, we're actually hoping to be providing this nutritional information very soon because we may be partner partnering with a nutritionist. So if that's the kind of information that you're looking for or you think that you guys would like, then we'll definitely be getting it to you very soon. Yeah, thank you. And please, again, I think it would be uh, e easier for us to keep track of the questions too if you are um, messaging the contact at Live in Farms email. Okay, in regards to the hive, how do you fully clean the hive without getting rid of the eggs and the baby mealworms? Okay, um, this so basically you're going. There's two different types of cleaning that we do. There's first like the daily cleaning, and I've already done that today. But generally, that will be like separation where you're taking out the different. Um, the different stages, just making sure they're all where they're supposed to be. Like the pupae, for example, will sometimes wind up in the mealworm um, bin once the mealworms have metamorphosized. And then you're going to want to also remove the frass from this bottom layer. Actually, I'm going to open this up. Okay. So yeah, you can remove the frass from this bottom layer quite easily, right? But yes, when you have the babies, when you're trying to take the frass out of this layer, this is not something you wanna do that often. What I do is I like give this a little shake, make sure everything falls, and you can't see the eggs with your naked eye. I mean, you could if you looked really close, but you can't really tell from all of this here. So what I do is I just tap it so that everything goes to one side. And then once, you know, relatively is clean, then you're going to put that back up and everything will have moved to the side. In terms of a deep clean, that will be a little more involved. I actually take all of the mealworms out of the hive. And the reason why we do that is because mealworms like to get into the very small nooks and crannies. And in doing that, you can utilize um, some of the great design features of the hive, which includes these little pins right here. And yeah, the, there's these little pins in here. And so the mesh is actually removable. I've had to clean insects from a lot of different enclosures. And it's very difficult to get into the nooks and crannies because mealworms and other insects start off when they're born very, very, very small. And so that means they can also poop in the most inconvenient places. And these pins, they stay out of your way while you're while you have the hive set up, but they, if you can actually pop them quite easily just by pushing down on them. Yeah, oh, they smell good. I'm excited to, to eat some. And about the strong smell, mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say it's a very strong ammonia-like smell. There, there's, of course, of course, a smell because, well, they're insects after all, and they're natural living beings. But and they poop a lot. Yeah, like, they do poop normal. a lot, but it, it's it's not a crazy smell, or it's, it's not something you can't stand. Plus, uh, the hive was built to be more or less odorless when covered up. So, I mean, it's kept in the kitchen and it, it doesn't really affect your cooking or your day-to-day -day life. No. Of course, when you do open it up and clean it up, there will be a little bit of a, an odor, but... Yeah, the uh, initial smell. Yeah. Once you get all the... I mean, the smell happens because of the buildup of poop and the buildup of, like, dead mealworms. And so once you remove all those things, the smell is not going to be as bad and then you close it back up and you don't smell anything at all. Um, I've had people who are desperately afraid of insects just not even notice that the hive is in there until I pointed it out. So, yeah, it's, this is, I'm, I think it's a, quite a great product. All right.
Yeah, is it ready? It smells good. You want to try some? Okay, I'm just going to put this back here and plug in the hive. Okay, just tuck it out of the way. And for those of you who do order the hive, you will find that you get a box. And if you look at our YouTube channel, you'll see the different components of the packaging. Our, uh, like our, the people who designed the packaging wanted to make sure that every single part of our package was uh, useful and nothing's really made out of plastic except that one, except the handle. And the box itself can be used to cover the hive. Right now we have some a light source here, which they don't love. We'll be covering the hive later. And uh, the mealworms do like the dark. So you can use the box for a lot of different reasons. We don't want you to just throw it away. Keep it, it's useful. Okay, let's take this out. All right. Nope. What is the funniest reaction someone had when you told them you sold more than two hundred fifty cents? Do you have an answer for this one? Uh, um, oh, okay. These are good. I don't know. Mm. I like that question. I, I don't even know. Okay. Well. Oops. Are they yummy, I guess? Not very funny. That's just the standard Yeah, usually they freak out more about the idea of it. But once somebody once said, like, are you okay? <laughs> yes. Yes. And my friends also know that I love insects and I they're one of my passions. So they're not too weirded out, actually. Oh, thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Perfect. Teamwork. Teamwork, thank you. Yeah, and you can see we're actually gonna let them cool for a little bit. Yeah, but they're quite crispy now. You wanna try one? Yeah, let's My try first some. One. Yeah. Cheers. Roddy, you wanna try some? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Put this here. It's my first time. Yeah. Roddy. <laughs> there you want one? Just take one. All right, Cheers. Living Farms. Cheers! Mmm, oh, okay. <laughs> it's mm. so crispy. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Mm. Wow. <laughs> I did not put them up to it. It is actually really good. <laughs> yeah. And we did actually, that was only 10 minutes, but it actually might be even cooked too long. So it'll, it'll depend. You can play around with it. And I don't want the spices. I did not put enough chili in here. Oh, puppy. Okay. We've got a guest dog. <laughs> no. Oh, he loves it. Uh? <laughs> I think Ludo would. Yes. Oh, he ate it. Oh, approved by dog. Yeah, approved. Ludo, you want one? Here, I can take another look. Oh, good boy. <laughs> It was a family company. <laughs> All right, I hope that was fun. I hope you guys enjoyed that. It was a little more, a little less formal than usual, but I guess it's never all that formal. Um, if you have your own meal more recipes, there's a lot of great ideas that were posted on the chat. Please do so. I'm gonna post up, I'm gonna put up the presentation again. Just gonna leave you with the last few slides. I will actually be, um, I'll be leaving the company or taking a personal leave for a little bit. And my colleague, Sovina here is going to be taking over and there will be a hiatus for a little bit. So we will let you all know based on the actual dates. And I really, oh, okay, let's see, Ivan. Another question, I'm currently using some old oats, rice bran, dry food, leftover veg food. Okay, no, they don't actually need to be cleaned daily. The oats, what you'll want to do, and the dry carbs is when you put them in, right? You do about like two handfuls and you wait until the end of the week. If there's still a lot left over, then yes, you are going to want to take them out and clean them. Yes, you want more, yes. Okay, and for the as for the uh, vegetable cuttings, those you're going to want to check at the end of the day. You don't necessarily have to take them out, but you do need to check that the mealworms are actually eating them. When it comes to things like 
uh, cut uh, cut herbs, for example. Like they don't really like those, but you know, if you for if you happen to mix those in with the vegetable cuttings, then you just want to double check that they're done with those. Okay, make sure that the leftovers are not left in the hive. Yeah, and the biggest thing with the food leftovers is not so much that it's going to like pile up or anything, but we also don't want to leave wet food in there for too long. Otherwise, mold might occur and that could actually cause some other problems in the hive. So just be, be diligent about checking when you do put wet food in there, especially. Okay, and last thing, I'm going to leave you all with, with the, the QR code here, which we always do. And please, please, it really does help us if you leave, um, if you leave like a response. And please tell us what you thought, what kind of things you would like to see more of, what kind of things would you like to see less of. This is all a work in progress, and we have the curriculum coming up soon. And We've been working really hard on it and it would be great to get some feedback. So thank you so much. I'm going to leave you guys with that and have a great day and everyone please stay safe and healthy.